sweet music. My section is going to be depressing as heck, y'all. So if you don't want to be depressed, I honor that for you. Um, but I'm going to get into it. It's a lot uh, and reasonably so. So my section is titled The Covert Dance, CIA Drug Trade and Its Impact on Black Americans. In case you forget that we live in an insidious country that actively harms humanity or you are just as tired as we are, today we are unpacking Reagan, their economic policy in America, including the CIA and OSS's role in organized crime as well as the drug trade. Um, the drug trade is relevant to the spread of cocaine, crack, heroin, and other drugs in the U.S., which deeply impacted impoverished Black neighborhoods. And if you already know the gist of that history, this section will not be like anything especially new. I'm going to give history from like World War II to like the late 90s. Um, but if you already know the gist, it's okay. Uh, I'm to give a trigger warning, warning. Many of these things that the United States government has done are very upsetting um, and have caused extensive harm, both internationally and nationally. So if you're not in a place where you feel safe hearing that information right now, or if you don't want to see my face or hear my voice specifically speak on these things, but still have interest in learning about the information that I'm presenting, um, we have links in their show notes as well as on our blog. Um, the CIA said they did all these things for the most part. Yeah. Uh, so like you can read all of it yourself mostly. without me telling you. Um, <laughs> And uh, the reason we're unpacking this is obvious in the context of They Clone Tyrone, a film that in many ways represents this history and impact. Many of these claims have been admitted by the OSS and CIA. They were the same. Uh, it's just like the OSS came first, the CIA came second. Um, and congressional releases as a result of lawsuits filed against the agency. And as we discussed in our episode on us, it's fairly co common for the U.S. to release information on past atrocities as a distraction for current ones. So, uh, and like, what's really like, it's not cute and it's not funny, but it's, uh, they'll be like, okay, like we did it, but like not in the way that you think. And that makes what makes it okay. And it's like, no, <laughs> but in it's the way still that... like admitting to it. <laughs> and like, just cause maybe like, we don't have enough evidence to like be like this guy, get him. Uh, doesn't mean it didn't happen. Like if you look media analysis and historiography lens, like there is a reason yeah. things are portrayed to us in a certain way and history will tell us eventually, or it'll be erased entirely. So we kind of have to do our own deductive reasoning. Um, um, just because they don't have like the exact names of every single guy doesn't mean it didn't happen. So yeah. um, I'm gonna America get into be it. like that, like abusive, you know, gaslighting boyfriend. Yeah, of, like yeah, but you like you don't know why I did it. Like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, and it's also you like did it, dude. What's like interesting about this is like the integrity of reporting or whatever. It's also like a white supremacist academia kind of energy mm -hmm. where I'm like, okay, sure, we don't have like the pictures of every guy who did it. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. So I'm going to get into why I keep saying that. Uh, so um, <laughs> the intricate relationship between the intelligence agencies and illicit activities, notably the collaboration between the CIA and organized crime, have left an indelible mark on the history of the drug trade. The reality of the CIA's complicity in funding drugs that were sold and distributed across black neighborhoods, combined with the economic policies enacted by Ronald Reagan, deeply impacted black American communities. The shift in public opinion surrounding poverty as a whole, combined with racism, fueled this narrative pushed by the Reagan administration and has also impacted media and public opinions around support, around support services as a whole. Like We still see that today. Um, and today we're exploring how the United States, the CIA and its predecessor, the OSS and President Reagan impacted black communities, as well as other nations, shedding light on the intricate connections between U.S. funded organized crime and the crack epidemic. Um, I do want to clarify the U.S. and CIA have been doing horrible things long before Reagan, and I'm going to cover some of them. Uh, things that really came to a head during Reagan's presidency, but have been happening, honestly, <laughs> for a disgusting amount of time. So the information... The dawn of America. Yeah. I am presenting either connects to the film directly or establishes context for how we got here, as well as provides a more clear understanding of what our government and intelligence agencies are capable of in the interest of eliminating any doubt anyone might have. Um, so some of this might not seem directly like impacted by the timeline of Reagan, but it all connects to really just show you like our government is gross. So I'm pulling this from a timeline from a congressional report titled Intelligence Authorization Act for Fiscal Year 1999 from the House of Representatives, which was released on May 7th, 1998. 
um, titled A Tangled Web, A History of the CIA Complicity in Drug International Trafficking from the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, the precursor to what we see take place during the Reagan's presidency was that the U.S.'s alignment with organized crime and international drug smuggling. The rationale for these engagements were to stop communism, control U.S. financial and territorial interests, and protect national security, as well as avoid congressional oversight. Um, the control and alliances with international drug smuggling provided finances that did not need congressional approval and provided easy access to chemicals and drugs for interrogation and control. Whether intentional or not, the results of the USA's policy around prioritizing national security and U.S. territorial and financial interests over human lives has negatively impacted our country and many others as a result. And the drugs that made it here were a direct result of either government funding, intervention, or neglect. So how did we get here? During World War II, the Office of Strategic Services, known as the OSS, and the Office of Naval Intelligence, known as the ONI, um, the precursor organizations for the CIA, forged alliances with leaders of the Italian mafia, notably figures like Charlie Lucky Lucino, uh, Meyer Lansky, Joe Adonis, and Frank Costello were recruited from the New York and Chicago underworlds. The collaboration aimed to maintain contact with the Sicilian mafia leaders exiled by Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. Domestically, the goal was to prevent sabotage on East Coast ports while in Italy. It aimed to gather uh, intelligence on Sicily and suppress the growing Italian Communist Party. It all <laughs> comes back to communism. We know the U.S. <laughs> loves to flex stopping communism as a smokescreen for atrocities. So while Charles Lucky Luciano was uh, imprisoned in New York, he earned a wartime service pardon and was deported to Italy. There, hmm. he established a heroin empire by diverting supplies from the legal market and building connections in Lebanon and Turkey. These connections supplied morphine based labs in Sicily. Additionally, the OSS and ONI collaborated with the Chinese gangsters that controlled vast opium, morphine, and heroin supplies, which contributed to the establishment of post World War II heroin trades, third pillar of the Golden Triangle, which is the border region of Thailand, Burma, Laos, and China's uh, Yunnan Peninsula province. So this is during World War II. So it's almost like during this time, it would have been great if the government um, and the OSS slash ONI focused more on stopping like the literal genocide of my family and the millions of others that our PA congressmen love to leverage as justification for backing Israel uh, and the current genocide taking place in Palestine um, against the Palestinian people. Uh, and did that instead of funneling money into drug trades to stop communism. <laughs> Yeah. So I'll keep going. After the yeah. war, um, in 1947, the newly formed CIA engaged in the U.S. intelligence community's anti-communist efforts. Love it. Uh, the agency collaborated with the mafia to secure control over Sicily, providing support for their battle against communist unions in Marseille. During this time, financial aid was directed to caution mobsters involved in heroin smuggling, particularly in their struggle for, the control, for control of the city's stocks. And by 1951, a partnership with Charles Lucky Luciano and the Corsians led to the establishment of the notorious French connection, dominating the global heroin trade from uh, until the early 1970s. Additionally, the CIA recruited members of organized crime groups in Japan to ensure the country's alignment with non-communist world, specifically uh, the Yakuza, <laughs> became a significant source of methamphetamine in Hawaii. Wow. Um, why <laughs> is the CIA putting so much of their time and energy into drugs? Well, let me tell you, uh, these connections to the international drug trade gave the CIA access to chemicals and drugs that would be used to conduct experiments and interrogations. In the 1950s, the CIA initiated a project Bluebird to explore the potential use of certain drugs for improving interrogation methods. This effort involved uh, this effort evolved into a broader program authorized by CIA head Alan Dules in April of 1953, which focused on the covert use of biological and chemical materials as part of the agency's ongoing behavioral control efforts. Under names like Project Artichoke and Project Chatter, these projects persisted into the 1960s, and the programs involved hundreds of unwitting test subjects who were administered various drugs, including LSD. Yeah. Um, and it's like a lot of like vulnerable communities, like and some people signed up for it, but they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And then they just start freaking out and they don't understand why because you've drugged them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this specific instance really makes me think of the clone Tyrone in that it's not far-fetched to think the government would have a secret underground bunker where it was kidnapping and experimenting on people without their consent uh, with drugs, uh, as many historical accounts reinforce the CIA's capacity to do so. Um, as we move into the 1960s, the CIA, in support of the U.S. war in Vietnam, renewed old and established connections with Laotian, Burmese, and Thai drug merchants, as well as a corrupt military and political leaders in Southeast Asia. Despite the notable increase in heroin production during this period, the agency's dealings with these individuals attracted minimal attention into the early 1970s. And then in 1967, Manuel Antonio Norega, he's important, became a CIA agent, uh, CIA asset specifically, uh, initially recruited by the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency in 1959. Following his assumption of leadership in Panama's intelligence services after the 1968 military coup, Norega became a valuable asset for U.S. covert operations. CIA Director George Bush specifically paid Norega $110,000 in 1976, despite evidence of his involvement in drug trafficking dating back to 1971. While payments were suspended during the Carter administration, Norega returned to the U.S. payroll when President Reagan assumed office in 1981. Throughout the 1980s, Norega was handsomely rewarded for supporting Contra forces in Nicaragua. What was in Nicaragua? By the Contras, friends. Cocaine, uh, receiving $200,000 from the CIA in 1986 alone. Um, May we just talked about like us unsettling, you know, governments. Oh, literally, <laughs> in yeah. that area. Like we were just talking about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's really gross, man. I don't, I don't know. So in May 1970, a Christian science monitor correspondent revealed that the CIA was aware of, if not directly involved in, the extensive movement of opium out of Laos. A charter pilot claimed that opium shipments received special CIA clearance and monitoring during flights southward out of the country. That is so insane. Yeah. Um, this re revelation coincided with around 330,000, uh, I can't say numbers, 30,000 U.S. service members in Vietnam being addicted to heroin. So the evidence was that there was 30,000 U.S. service members addicted to the heroin that they had been shipping out uh, through uh, the opium shipments. They didn't even want to be there. Yep. So in 1972, I know I told you it's it's a lot. It's <laughs> by 1972, no. Yale University doctoral student Alfred McCoy published a groundbreaking study titled "The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia: Exposing the Cold War Politics and U.S. Covert Operations." Uh, contributed to the heroin boom in the Golden Triangle. The CIA attempted to suppress McCoy's book, but in 1973, Thai national Pudapran. Uh, Tom Caron was arrested in connection with the seizure of 59 pounds of opium in Chicago. As a CIA informant on narcotics trafficking in northern Thailand, Karam Karan claims that the agency had full knowledge of his actions. The U.S. Justice Department states that the CIA quashed the case to avoid potential embarrassment due to Karam Karan's involvement in CIA activities in Thailand, Burma, and elsewhere. Um, by June 1975, we're not even to Reagan yet, uh, Mexican police, <laughs> aided by U.S. drug agents, arrested Albert Cecilia Falcon, whose Tijuana-based operations reportedly generated $3.6 million per week from cocaine and marijuana sales <sighs> in the United States. Cecilia claimed that the CIA... Uh, pro what he claimed to be a CIA protege, trained as part of the agency's anti-Castro effort, efforts uh, in exchange for assisting in weapons movement for certain groups in Central America. The CIA allegedly facilitated his drug trafficking. Um, in 1974, Cecilia's aide, Jose Agozzi, uh, a CIA-trained intelligence officer and Bay of Pigs veteran, reportedly secured agency support for a right-wing plot to overthrow the Portuguese government. Among Cecilia's supporters are influential figures, including Miguel Nazar Haro, uh, a head, who was the head of the DFS, when acknowledged by the CIA as one of the most important source of their most important source in Mexico and Central America. Um, when Nazar was implicated in a stolen car ring later on, the CIA intervened to prevent his indictment in the United States. So. Um, Sus exactly. Lots of sus things taking place. Lots of names that are very clearly deeply rooted in drug trafficking 
et cetera, um, that they're it's like, why paying. coming up in your mouth, you know? Yeah. That yeah. they're like literally paying and collaborating with. Um, so, and some of this is alleged, like they don't have, as I said, they don't have the pictures, they don't have exact evidence, but there's enough to insinuate proof, uh, for the public <laughs> opinion, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not writing an academic paper on this, but I think based on reading all of these documents that that seems right. Um, <laughs> And in April 1978, a Soviet-backed coup in Afghanistan paved the way for explosive growth in the Southwest Asian heroin trade. The CIA supported rebel Mujahideen. This is document on paper, by the way, this part. Um, The CIA Mm -hmm. supported rebel Mujahideen, expanded opium production to fund their insurgency. Between 1982 and 1989, the CIA sent billions of dollars in weapons and aid to Mujahideen, resulting in a significant increase in annual opium production in Afghanistan, reaching about 80 or 800 tons from 250 tons. By 1986, the State Department acknowledged Afghanistan as probably the world's largest producer of opium for export and the primary source of the Southwest Asian heroin in the United States. Despite the U.S. officials... Despite this, U.S. officials failed to take action to curb production, maintaining public support for Mujahideen and ensuring smooth relations with Pakistan, whose leaders were deeply implicated in the heroin trade and assisted in channeling CIA support to the Afghan rebels. It's like you sound like you're like you're a crazy person when you're like, and this is like, <laughs> and this isn't like a congressional <laughs> report. Yeah, like Congress. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, yeah, that was us. Yeah, and it gets it gets grosser, um, specifically once we hit the '80s, because uh, John Kerry uh, wrote with a subcommittee, like published a whole paper that basically confirmed that if they didn't do it directly, they let it happen, and were working with these people. So mm-hmm. whether they meant to or not, they caused it. Um, that is proven. Um, the intent is what's not proved, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so in June 1980, the CIA, despite prior knowledge, failed to prevent no members of the Bolivian army, assisted by Argentine counterparts, from orchestrating the cocaine coup. Former DEA agent Michael Levine contended that the agency not only failed to intervene, but actively supported cocaine trafficking in Bolivia, and government officials attempting to combat traffickers reportedly faced violence, including torture and death orchestrated by CIA-sponsored paramilitary terrorists. Under the command of fugitive Nazi war criminal Klaus Barbie, who was also allegedly protected by the CIA. Of course. Yeah, but we're but we're we're, we're not anti-Semitic. It's fine. Um, in February 1985, the DAA uh, agent Enrique Kiki Cap- Camarena uh, was kidnapped and murdered in Mexico. DEA, FBI, and U.S. Customs Service investigators accused the CIA of obstructing their investigation of this, alleging that the CIA prioritized protecting its assets, including top drug trafficker Miguel Alex Feliz Gallardo, um, instead of like human lives. So in 1982, the DEA discovered that Felix Gallardo was moving 20 million monthly through a Bank of America account, but the CIA did not cooperate with the investigation. Gallardo's main partner, Honduran drug lord Juan uh, Ramon Mata Balestros, uh, had amassed a two billion fortune as a cocaine supplier to the Alberto Cecilia Falcon. Um, Mata's air transport firm, Setco, received $186,000 from the U.S. State Department to fly humanitarian supplies to Nicaraguan Contras from 1983 to 1985, and the government witnessed witnesses in the trials of Camara's accused killers alleged that the CIA protected leading Mexican drug traffickers in exchange for their financial support to the Contras. Also important. Um, in 1988, the Reagan administration deemed Manuel Norega no longer useful to the Contra cause and approved its an indictment of Norega on drug charges. And U.S. State Senate... We don't need him anymore. <laughs> yeah. It was like, we already did what we wanted. Um, U.S. Senate investigators had discovered substantial information about the criminal involvement of top Panaman... Uh, Panamanian... Panamanian. Yeah. Panamanian <laughs> officials uh, for nearly two decades... 
with little response from the United States. By April 1989, the Senate Subcommittee on Terrorism, Narcotics, and International Communications, led by Senator John Kerry, released a 1,166-page report on drug corruption in Central America and the Caribbean. The report reveals substantial evidence of drug smuggling by individuals associated with the Contras, their suppliers, pilots, and mercenaries working in the region. U.S. officials, the subcommittee notes, failed to address the drug issue and to avoid jeopardizing the war efforts against Nicaragua. Some senior policymakers believed that using drug money was a perfect solution to the Contras funding problems. Perfect, that's what we're saying? Yep. Solution? Yep. That's also what we're saying? Okay. Um, and in January 1993, Honduran businessman Ingenio Milani. Melina Osario was arrested in Lubbock, Texas, for supplying $90,000 worth of cocaine to DEA agents. Melina claimed to work with the CIA, providing political intelligence. Subsequently, a letter from CIA headquarters led to the dismissal of his case. Melina later admitted his drug involvement wasn't a CIA operation, but acknowledged the agency protected him due to his value as a political intelligence source in Honduras. In November 1996, former head of Venezuelan National Guard and CIA operative Jen Ramon Jillian Davila was indicted in Miami on charges of smuggling 22 tons of cocaine into the United States. Over a ton of cocaine was shipped to the country with CIA approvals as part of an undercover program aimed at catching drug smugglers and an operation kept secret from other U.S. agencies. So uh, there were people who called these issues out uh, who were heavily scrutinized, suppressed, or discredited. As we mentioned before, Alfred McCoy and their book um, was suppressed by the CAA, CIA. But uh, the difference between him and who I'm about to mention is this was before the internet. After mm. the internet, we got Gary Webb. Uh, mm. who, uh, yeah, that's funny. It's funny because Gary Webb and he was on the web. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. what's it? So I'm going to explain why he's super interesting. So an article titled What We Really Know About the CIA and Crack by Daniel Finn on the Jacobine, uh, they discuss the controversial stance of Gary Webb, who wrote for the San Jose Mercury News. So Webb wrote a series called The Dark Alliance, the story behind the crack explosion on August 18th, 1996, which argued that the CIA had been funneling drugs into L.A. to be distributed in black neighborhoods, specifically called uh, the CIA Contra Crack Cocaine Controversy, a review of the Justice Department's investigations and pr prosecutions. Uh, this is like a follow-up article. So specifically in that article from the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, which is on their website, they wrote, the introduction of the first installment of the series read, for the better part of a decade, a San Francisco Bay Area drug ring sold tons of cocaine to the Crips and Blood Street Gangs of Los Angeles and funneled millions of drug profits to, to a Latin American guerrilla army run by... U the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, a Mercury News investigation has found. This drug network opened up the first pipeline between Colombia's cocaine cartels and black neighborhoods of Los Angeles, a city known as the crack capital of the world. The cocaine that flooded in helped spark a crack explosion in urban America and provided the cash and connections needed for the LA's gangs to buy automatic weapons. So the three-day three article series titled The Dark Alliance states Ricky Donnell Ross, a 19-year-old who in the early 1980s became a significant figure in the Los Angeles drug operation, uh, they depict him as a disillusioned young man on the streets of South Central Los Angeles. Starting with a small-scale cocaine peddling, Ross quickly rose to become one of the largest cocaine dealers in South California, ultimately facing federal drug trafficking charges on March 1996. The Dark Alliance series asserts that Ross's ascent in the drug trade was facilitated by Oscar Danilo Blandin and Norwin Menzies, individuals linked to the FDN, a group associated with the Nicaraguan Contras. Blandin and Menzies allegedly slipped, supplied Ross with large quantities of cocaine, which he converted into crack and distributed in black communities in South Central Los Angeles. These profits from drug trafficking operation were claimed to have been used by Blandin and Menzies to support Contra the Contra Army's war efforts. Um, the Jacobin article, uh, in that article, they note that while there were holes and flaws in Webb's reporting, further articles that came out, including the John Kerry report as, and a report published by a CIA person managing a nightmare, uh, claim that the CIA was at the very least complicit in these happenings. And the article on the Jacobin saying, the CIA claimed that any story linking it to the 1980s crack cocaine explosion was conspiratorial slander, but the evidence of its complicity is all there in the congressional record. While the CIA 
CIA's intention was maintaining national security and American interests, the evidence showcases that they were ready and willing to sacrifice the Black community and those impacted by poverty to maintain it. And in an article titled Managing a Nightmare, how the CIA watched over the destruction of Gary Webb on the intercept by Ryan Devereaux, they say that in 1985, more than a decade before that series was published, there were journalists like Robert Perry and Brian Barger that also outlined Contra's involvement in cocaine trafficking as a means to fund war efforts in Nicaragua. And in a, they, it is in a move that foreshadowed Webb's experience, the Reagan White House launched a concerted behind the scenes campaign to besmirch the professionalism of Perry and Barger and to discredit all reporting on Contras and drugs. Additionally, the Jacobin article references another, specifically a 1997 article in the Columbia Journalism Review titled The Storm Over the Dark Alliance by Peter Kornbla, where he highlights that there was no question that the Dark Alliance included flaws, which the CIA was able to exploit. But Kornbla said the series was problematic. This, the Kornbla said the series was problematically sourced and criticized for its repeated promises of evidence that on close reading it did not deliver, and it failed to definitively connect the story's key players to the CIA, but he noted there were inconsistencies in Webb's timeline of events. Kornbla also uncovered problems, however, with the retaliatory reports described as balanced by the CIA, and in a case of the LA Times, he wrote the paper stumbled into the same problems of hyperbole, selectivity, and credibility that was it was attempting to expose, while ignoring declassified evidence, uh, also neglected by the New York Times and Washington Post, that lent credibility to Webb's thesis. Clearly, there was room to advance a contra drug CIA story rather than to simply denounce it. Um, and to Webb's own recollection of events before his unfortunate loss of his life in 2006, he reflected in his book called Into the Buzzsaw that prior to Dark Alliance, I was winning awards, getting raises, lecturing college classes, appearing in TV shows and judging in journalism contests. And then I wrote some stories that made me realize how sadly misplaced my bliss had been. The reason I'd enjoyed such smooth sailing for so long hadn't been, as I assumed, because I was a careful and vigilant, I was careful and diligent and good at my job. The truth was that in all those years, I hadn't written anything important enough to suppress. So um, unfortunately, yeah, uh, all of the suppression efforts and stuff like that, like in terms of how it impacted him, it really impacted his mental health and that's how he lost his life. Um, and that is really sad. But essentially, ever all the evidence about what he said, well, in terms of, as I said, like in the academic space, like there were flaws in his reporting, but in the declassified documents that came out, it did validate that there was reason to question the Contra CIA uh, mm. relationship and that these key players like did exist. Like obviously the CIA is going to cover their tracks track super well. Like it's going to be hard to report on them. The whole thing is that they're a secret intelligence agency mm -hmm. like that isn't public record. So like um, there were actual declassified documents that validated a lot of Webb's claims. And unfortunately, you know, he was treated so poorly by his colleagues and other people that it really impacted him. Um, yeah, that they were inspired to like shut him down instead of investigate further. Yeah. And that what's interesting about this is that the CIA for him didn't even push for that to happen. It was like the monkey in a barrel situation where like they were just ready to defend the government like other news programs. Mm -hmm. Like they were just like, we know if you uh, don't defend the government, your career gets trashed too. So we're going to go in hard. And they like destroyed this man um, who was genuinely mm -hmm. presenting something that had validity clearly from the things that Congress themselves admitted took place. So it's, it's a whole thing. I wrote more about it if you want to read it in our blog, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the rest of that section. Um, essentially, uh, why is this relevant to They Clone Tyrone? These allegations and the historical context surrounding them provide the backdrop for the Glen. It validates and reinforces the justified distrust of organizations like the CIA and our government that while is while there is not enough evidence, although that is debatable in my opinion, to prove without a doubt that the CIA directly funneled drugs into black neighborhoods, there is enough evidence to prove that they were at the very least complicit and funding players in that trade that made that funneling possible, and that the US government and the CIA are not above experimenting on its populations as a means of control and are willing to use drugs as a means to do so. And that our government has evidence instances that it has openly admitted to manipulating and funding crime organizations to fund wars to 
avoid congressional oversight and do whatever the fuck else they think protects national security and American interests, mm -hmm. um, even if that comes at the cost of millions of innocent lives to prevent communism, I guess. Um, it's honestly like, it is clear that like, sure, maybe they weren't like, yeah, funnel it in there. But also they weren't like, oh, we care about black people enough to not have that be the result of what we're doing. Like the racism is there. Um, mm -hmm. Whether they gave the order for it or not, the lack of care for those communities, the systemic machine that is white supremacy, racism and capitalism in our country did the work for them. Yeah. Um, and the last part of my section, uh, I know this is a lot, uh, is Reaganomics and the impact on black economic mobility. Um, so in unpacking the philosophy surrounding Reaganomics and the viewpoints of those in power during this time, it is very clear the visceral hatred of the administration felt towards poverty. Um, there's also audio recordings. Literally, you don't you don't have to listen to them. They're horrific. But uh, there's an audio recording proving how racist Reagan and Nixon were, um, hmm. where they're having a conversation. And it's like on, I put a link to it, but you do not have to listen to it. It's awful. Um, so the combination of these two very harmful biases deeply influences Reagan's economic policy and directly harm the black community. It's not so different than some of the arguments we see today to remove free lunch programs for children, arguments against raising the minimum wage, or even the myth of welfare greens and the government benefit exploitation idea. Um, it's clear as well in the distribution of financial resources that this country hasn't cared about human lives more than money in a really long time, if ever. Uh, and, in a, and in a paper titled Reaganomics and its Implications for African-American Family Life by Maurice A. St. Pierre on a Journal of Black Studies in 1991, they outline the perspective of many Reagan supporting economists of the time. The context surrounding the 1980s was that there was a double digit inflation that was not based on, pre like kind of conflicted with the previous understanding of Keynesian model of economic theory. Uh, and it, this is their push towards supply side economics. So they mm -hmm. say that other supply siders like Bruce Bartlett, former staff member of the Republican Congressman Jack Kemp, specifically drew attention to the need to index the tax code for inflation, to cut rates across the board, cap government spending, and reduce regulations and government credit activities as a prescription for improving America, the American economy. The irony around these views is that simultaneously, the government was sending hundreds of thousands of dollars to fund wars and CIA-backed agents that they knew were dealing drugs. So cut government funding where? Uh, they also increased the military budget by 144%, but... <laughs> Let's cut food stamps. Who's counting? Who's um, counting? They continued to say that the goal of supply side economics was to help American economy and argued it would benefit minorities and black people by extension. Sure. To give you a better idea of the kind, it's like rich people being like, let them eat cake. It's literally let them eat cake. Like, Mm -hmm. it's, them, economics it's them having like cake. no idea what actually is existing in any other class other than their own and like not caring um so like their idea of what how to fix it it's like that whole um they went to a village and like planted a garden and then the villagers didn't help them because they're like that's where the rhinos run why would you plant mm -hmm. a garden there it's stupid and it was like if you asked us where to plant the garden we would have told you you know what i mean yeah. So it's like the white savior complex of like, let's help them, but we have no idea how, and you're not asking the people there how they need help. Um, so rich people should not make the decisions <laughs> for how to help mm -hmm. people who are in need um, at the end of the day. So to give you a better idea of the kinds of people we're dealing with, economist Thomas Sowell of the Hoover Institution, uh, for example, argued in favor of dismantling such government programs as minimum wage, aids to education, and job training, and turning those issues over to the private sector, who we know do a great job. Uh, Sowell asserted that many other government programs, the minimum wage, severely limited the freedoms of Black people to make decisions about what wage they will accept for employment, um, which is actually like, no, um, it, <laughs> it removes any protection they have from being exploited and paid under a minimum, um, but sure. Uh, he supported the elimination of current aid to education programs in which only public schools receive government funds. And even though these schools often did not pri provide adequate education, instead he sought a system that would provide vouchers to parents so that they could choose what school they thought offered the best education at the illusion of choice. Uh, additionally, mm -hmm. he was against government regulations because they implied people were better off with less options. The above government, uh, the above arguments are of interest because they are reflective of some of the basic values of American life of there ain't no such thing as free lunch is very much like you. 
everyone can work. And if you don't work, you deserve to die. Uh, it really was that like mm -hmm. belief of that. Um, uh, and it was the way Arthur uh, Shenfield, he was an economist. That's what it comes from him. Um, and it emphasized mm -hmm. that work ethic, which some would argue that like America's worth ethic, work ethic was worth it. <laughs> and would mm. present itself like people want to work you know um yeah and was the best thing about america so that's what his belief system was in reading this the delusion is delusioning um and in the late 1970s and early 1980s the reagan administration um well specifically before he got there and then as he continued to be there uh after the 1981 election the reagan administration's budget cuts disproportionately impacted black americans especially in housing and urban development the emphasis on increased defense spending as again i said by 144.5 percent they increased the defense spending led to a surge in military enlistment among young black males due to limited job opportunities so they're like put all the jobs into the military they're not going to have a choice the whole thing is that mm -hmm. they're not going to have a choice, but they're preaching to the general public who don't have the Internet to tell them they're wrong, <laughs> that uh, this will give them more choices. Um, anyway, Reaganomics exacerbated uh, existing disparities, increased the likelihood of poverty among black children and the reductions in government assistance programs such as aid to families with dependent children and child support enforcement hit black families harder than white families. Reagan era reforms driven by supply side economics aimed to cut welfare spending affecting the ACE FDC, the Amer aid to families with dependent children and uh, the child support enforcement. Uh, and these Changes including job search requirements and cuts to allowances for uh, the larger ACDF or ACDC. Uh, oh my God, AFDC. I'm dyslexic, friends. Uh, <laughs> forgive me. Households disproportionately affected Black American families. There was even like one guy who like wanted to force that if you had a kid under the age of 16 that you had to live with your parents um, so that they wouldn't receive double checks essentially mm. even though twice as much money was still needed you still had twice as many kids um you, if your kids had kids you know what i mean like it's still mm -hmm. it was a manipulation tactic to limit amount of money that was going out and make it significantly difficult more difficult for people who needed support and aid to receive aid um barriers essentially uh and they also cut summer meal programs uh increased restrictions on free breakfast and lunch and changed food stamps regulations to uh basically lower the amount that people would get so further which further strain vulnerable communities additionally the elimination of programs like CETA or public service employment along with funding costs to job poor were cut uh, hindering job opportunities for economically disadvantaged individuals particularly black americans really to funnel them into the military because uh, they didn't have any other choice these policy mm -hmm. changes force many to seek financial support outside of traditional avenues as well due to lack of legitimate earning opportunities so the rise in crime um, cause that was the only way to get money. Uh, if the government can go <laughs> mm -hmm. do organized crime, why can't the average person? Um, so <laughs> from the YouTube video and lecture titled Reaganomics, the impact on black economic mobility from the Institute of politics from Harvard Kennedy school recorded on March of 1982. Thank you again, Gabe, for sharing that with me. Um, the lecture on Reaganomics, uh, and it's impact, they speak on the, uh, Reaganomics and its impact on Black economic mobility and discusses a shift in public perception around welfare during the Reagan administration. So uh, Professor Ronald Ferguson highlights a survey comparing attitudes towards public welfare versus help for the needy. And the results revealed that when uh, they gave they about two separate surveys and in one they put public welfare as an option and on another they put help for the needy, just to clarify. Um, and the results revealed that when labeled as public welfare, many respondents considered that the first option to cut funding to um, above like streets or like public, other public supports, education, et cetera. They wanted to cut public welfare, but if they listed it as help for the needy, that was the last thing on the list. They thought people mm. who needed help should receive the help. They would not request fu like reducing funding to that. Um, and it kind of like, if you think of like how the PR for the CIA mm -hmm. existed, this is like a test for them to see, <laughs> How can yeah. we get people to not care about poor people? It's all about the marketing. Um, so mm -hmm. many responders consider yeah, that welfare queen marketing. Mm -hmm, exactly. So the shift in perception driven by the Reagan administration portrayed welfare recipients as lazy and taking advantage of the system. Despite Reagan's intention to incentivize work, the legislation resulted in people opting to stay on welfare for financial security because the wages that he removed the minimum wage 
<laughs> the wages from jobs were so low that they couldn't cover basic necessities. Uh, this situation persists today with companies like Walmart paying low wages, leaving employees dependent upon support services so that they won't actually raise the wage because they know that the government will cover that gap. So the idea that the rich people will do the right thing is evidence to not be right or true. Um, and how that all coincides with drugs is that poverty, unfortunately, when you live in a hard time and there's no jobs, there's, I have to find a way to earn money to protect your family. And largely mm -hmm. in those neighborhoods, guess what was being funneled in, in mass amounts, drugs. Yeah, that 19-year-old became a drug lord. Yeah, to, like, to feed his family, I imagine. Like, <laughs> honestly, it's, yeah, it's super gross. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of this is, it ties back to this idea of the illusion of choice, right? So all these people think they had a choice. You think you're choosing to join the military. You think you're choosing, like, all of them thought there was some choice in that. That they were making those decisions and instead they were just a tool for oppression um yeah something uh that's really great about the gary webb thing is that like the reason his claim got so much popularity before he was like intentionally slandered was because of the internet and like uh black americans like seeing his paper mm -hmm. um and then like using that to put up lawsuits against the CIA and the government. Um, essentially, like, even if, like, they were like, it's not factually backed or whatever, like, it was what sparked that wide understanding that that's what was happening, whether they meant to or not, that's what was happening. And, like, that they had a way reason to be angry and to protest, like, additionally, other than, like, the million other things. But, like, they had evidence mm -hmm. of them doing it enough to validate, like, their legal claims and stuff like that. So uh, that was the power of the Internet. So I think of, like, the uh, first guy who wrote about it who got silenced. Uh, the reason they couldn't silence Gary Webb is because of the Internet. And I think of social media today and how that really acts as, like, the tool that, like, they have the <laughs> fucking Disney Hulu propaganda of the... <sighs> of what's happening in Palestine right now. And mm -hmm. that's not accurate, but we have TikTok and we have yeah. Instagram. Like we have the social media that's showing us that that's not real. So there are people who are going to fall into the propaganda of thinking it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But social media is here. <laughs> there's a whole conversation right there about mass mainstream media um, and the fact that they're all like the mainstream media is all controlled by the same three companies. And so that's why it's so easy for them to silence um, these uh, reports. And it still happens today. There's things like local news organizations are silenced because of things that are happening. Like I've experienced that. And so mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons why I purposely work <laughs> in non-mainstream media um, and why, mm -hmm. you know, we have a world like uh, a place like pa like podcasts and um, YouTube where people can be sharing information and trying to get the truth out there. And like you were saying, in different social media aspects. Um, that yeah. we didn't and they also have use radio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although there's also like the, there's like a, the, the radio, there's like a radio channel that I don't remember what it's called, but it's supposedly like where the government comes clean and they'll be like, oh, we're reporting on it. And it turns out that it's actually um, run like it, it's manipulated and the, the government mm. is like actually a part of it. It's not <laughs> someone revealing what the government is up to. It's the government being like, yeah, tell them about this stuff. Yeah. So they're distracted. Um Yeah. Yeah. That's a whole and then, thing. yeah. Distraction, <laughs> distraction, distraction. That's the really big thing is like, you know, like the magic trick of like, look over here and then boop, 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 I'm doing stuff over here. Um, that's exactly what this film really was because all of those little things, like it, what we were seeing was like the white powder, the, um, the church, all of those things brought like passive, like joy. And so like, it, again, it was like the opiate of the masses. So if we're just like, mm -hmm. you know, placated and happy, and then we're distracted and we're not, you know, aware of how it's harming us, then we're going to allow it to keep doing that. Um, mm -hmm. So if you keep people happy, keep them on drugs, you keep them like 
thinking they have some type of power, no one's saying nothing. No one's doing mm-hmm. nothing to get out of it. And you win. Yeah, exactly. So ultimately, keep spreading the word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the clown Tyrone. Um, <laughs> well, I hope you like that episode. It's, it's, it's uh, super lo- lengthy and educational um, from both sides. I think that was really fun. Yeah. Um, we have more for this series. We got, I believe, two more episodes, and then we're going to be shifting into something new. So um, let us know what you think about Fake Clone Tyrone. Uh, have you seen it? What is your favorite black exploitation film that you think I should watch? Um, <laughs> anything like that. Uh, and do you agree that the CIA was doing like all over the place, the whole world? That's insane. Yeah. And those ones are admitted. Like the lot, yeah. like 90% of that didn't have the word allegedly attached to it. Those have been yeah. admitted things the CIA has on record done. <laughs> Whenever I said allegedly, that was the only one that was like, oh, we don't have like all the names and evidence and whatever. Mm-hmm. I said that like three times of that whole list. <laughs> Yeah. So 90 is a lot. It's a lot of them admitting that they're garbage. So yeah. Again, just because you're paranoid. Doesn't yeah, mean and they're the ones whose laws were supposed to be following. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, don't get married. Delete your kids. I'm sad now. Yeah. <laughs> your kids. Or they're manipulating your kids. They won't let you feed your kids. Or what you're allowed to feed your kids is poison. And then yeah. they Put your kids in the military or in the drug world and they go, oh, dang. Sorry. That sucks yeah. for the choice you made. And they own all the companies and then say, you have a choice. Yeah. Between yes, the original things. choice. Yeah. Choose one of these three companies who owns everything. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have commercials that pretend we have competition. It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. It is so weird. Okay. Bye.